Amen. Uh, so the first text uh, that I want to use is 2 Peter 1 3. I know we've talked about this even recently. 2 Peter 1 3 and 4. I didn't really title tonight's message. Uh, I think if but the main concept that I want to get to is, is regarding temptation and, and the trials of temptation. Um, so 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. The last time I used it, I, I spoke about this verse, we talked a lot about knowledge. We talked about the fact that the word is epignosis, which have, describes an experiential knowledge, which is more than just reading a book. And that whenever we consider the concept that we gain knowledge of God's word, but then we have to take the knowledge that we've gained and we actually have to live it in the real world. And whenever we're living in the real world, many times we find ourselves uh, engaged in situations that, 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 that through temptation that cause us, well, we, if we're, all, we're honest with one another, we've all stumbled, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And, but yet at the same time, God is gracious and he's merciful and he's long suffering and he comes in and he'll pull it and he picks us back up. Amen. And then, and then what the desire of the Holy Spirit is that, that, that thing that we just went through would work together for good because we are one that loves the Lord. Amen. And that the Holy Spirit uses it in our life to teach us and we gain experiential knowledge. And so this experiential knowledge is of him to know him. Amen. To know him, to know his goodness, to know his grace, praise God, to know his love. Amen. And, 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 to, and to walk in a knowledge of him. And listen, what he's done is he's called us in that last part of that verse. And he's called us to glory and virtue. And I just want to just stick on that a little bit longer about the, the blessing of knowing God. You know, this has really been something that's been stirred in my heart for quite some time now, and I've shared it a little bit with you guys, but just the fact that God in his grace and his mercy, that he called me, amen, he called me out of darkness into his marvelous light, and that he's also called me to, to, to function in, the, in a ministry role, and he called me to preach his truth and to teach and, and to minister to people. And, and it's just such a blessing to know and to know him, amen. And so to know God's will and also to know God's will for the world, that what's going on in the world. I mean, listen, I, I shared this scripture recently, but the fact that he says he no longer calls us servants, he calls us friends because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. And the Holy Spirit, through the word of God, wants you and I to know what is going on. He wants us to be able to understand the signs of the times and the seasons that we're living in. And, but, in but in addition to that, what about for your own personal life? God's spirit wants to speak to you about his will for your own personal life. And without the knowledge of God, without knowing God, then we're not going to know God's plan for our life, obviously. Hosea 4, 6 says this, that his people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. And he said, listen, because you rejected my knowledge, I'm going to reject you. And I don't know about you, but I do not want to be a Christian that rejects the knowledge of God. And sadly, I do believe that in the condition of the overall church, and I understand that this church is not the overall church, and I understand that the majority of you probably are not really living that way, but I think it's so important that we understand the importance of not rejecting the knowledge of God. Amen? So look at the, the next part of this verse. It's in 2 Peter 1, 4. It says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. I just want to just stop this for a second because I feel like I'm going to probably repeat that concept a few times. A partaker of the divine nature. And that through that, we have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So the more we know Jesus, the more we're being called towards glory and virtue. And I want you to know that glory... That the glory of God is focused on the things of God. Like in other words, 
People can be focused on other things in their life. People can be focused on all kinds of things, the, the, the cares of the world and, and, and various things like that. But, but a person that's truly getting closer to God is going to start to concern or can be consumed with his desire to see God's glory manifest. And look, we, we, we spend quite a bit on talking about the glory of God, but I can't get it out of my spirit that the Lord has said, look, as surely as I live, my glory will fill the earth. Amen. And so and he's looking for people like you and he's looking for people like me that will allow his glory to be released on the earth. He wants you and I to be witnesses for his kingdom. And then and then the idea of virtue describes moral excellence. Look, it, whenever the Lord starts to move us closer and closer to the truth, starts to move us closer and closer to the will of God, then, then the Holy Spirit in us begins to work on our hearts. To have a desire to be more like Jesus. To be more like Jesus and less like Adam. Philippians 2.13 says that it's God, amen, that works in you. Both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. I want you to know tonight that the Holy Spirit wants to work in you to move you in that right direction. But not only that, to do the work in you, amen, that we have become partakers of his divine nature. So the more we know him, trust him, grow in him and die to self, the more we move towards him. And this results in an escape from the corruption that is in the world through lust. And listen, if we're honest with one another, the closer we get to Jesus, the less we want to sin, right? The more we sin, the less we want to get closer to Jesus. And, and there's a there's a battle that tends to rage on the inside. That's Galatians five seventeen. The flesh is lusting against the spirit. The spirit is lusting against the flesh. And you know we do know this that this present world that we live in, because it said it said about escaping the corruption of the world through lust. And we know that this present world that we live in, we understand that it's because of the fall of Adam and the various things that have happened. But look in Galatians chapter one. It says this, Galatians 1, 4, you don't have to go there. It says, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. I mean, we were just walking around in so much darkness and sin. The world, I mean, have you ever even thought about this? You probably don't think this way. Maybe you do. Have you ever even thought of what would have happened had God the Father not sent Jesus or had or had Jesus not done what he was supposed to do? I know theoretically that couldn't happen, but but have you ever thought of that about the wickedness and how dark the world would be like without the presence of God or without the presence of the Holy Spirit on the earth? I mean. It, it would be really, really bad, right? And uh, that's about the best I can do right there. And so, but, but look, for, for believers, so we understand that the world is full of corruption. We understand these things. And so for many humans, in the heart and lives of many humans, there's a battle that's raging in their spirit, man, or in their inner man, in their soul, really. I mean, the battle's really raging in the soulish realm because it's connected to the mind. And most of the time, the battle is really in the mind. Even with whenever we transition into talking about temptation, the majority of that's really where the battle is located because it's the mind that's driving our flesh to go in the wrong direction whenever we do that. And, and not only that, though, Christians, there's so many Christians, believers that love God, that find themselves in an ongoing spiritual struggle. And, and I know for a fact that for many, many years of my Christian walk, that's been the case. But I do believe with all of my heart that the word of God teaches us how to walk in victory and that the Holy Spirit will flow. The Holy Spirit's grace or the Holy Spirit, who is grace, will flow in our lives, empower us and strengthen us. Amen. So that we don't have to live in bondage to that and that we can walk in the will of God. So one thing that I do want to mention, I'm not going to say a lot about this, but the sin, sin's power is the law. That comes out of 1 Corinthians 15, 56. So I want you, I want to just say that again. You, can you put that up there just so they can see it? 1 Corinthians 15, 56, that the power of sin is the law. Now, many people that would um, 
that would that have been in church for any length of time, you would say, well, I don't read. I'm not like trying to live according to the Ten Commandments. I understand the concept of grace. But look, what you got to understand is, is that the main point I'm right, trying to make here is that when a human being tries to live for God or live above the power of sin through his own strength, that's really what I'm talking about here. When we try to live for God through our own strength. Because, see, the law did not allow the Holy Spirit to live on the inside of us. Whenever they were living in the old covenant, they did not have access to the Holy Spirit like you and I do. And so what it says is that the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. And so whenever we attempt to live for God in our own strength, according to rules, regulations, or according to even just our own and listen, whenever we're talking about rules and regulations, you can try to quote scripture to try to give yourself victory over the power of sin. There's nothing wrong with quoting scripture. Jesus quoted scripture to the enemy. But what I'm trying to say is that, listen, if you and I'm not trying to get technical, but I'm going to make a point. If you're putting your faith in the quoting of scripture instead of putting your faith in what Christ has done, now you're changing the object of your faith. What we need to understand is this, is that what Jesus did at the cross defeated the powers of darkness and that if we will keep our faith in that we will walk in right relationship with the Lord and the Holy Spirit will perform in us the divine nature that we're a partaker of will perform in us the desire both to will and to do according to his good pleasure and so this and so sin's power is the law and listen I want to say this I don't know that I've ever said it like this before but I'm gonna the flesh's power is the evil nature and the, the, see, you have you have evil already in you from the fall. The sinful nature is already in you, and that is what is giving power to the flesh. I already did it once. I'm not going to do it again. But when I fell down on the on the altar and I made the point that something is animating the flesh, something is giving life to the flesh. And so when he's talking about in the flesh, there is a direct connection. It's not the same word, but there is a direct connection to the evil nature or the sinful nature and the lust of the flesh, all right? And so just hold that thought for a second. But but listen, if you did not have an evil nature or a sinful nature in you, you wouldn't have a problem with the lust of the flesh. You wouldn't have a problem with wanting to go towards something that you didn't have. So I'm just trying to u utilize two different terms, but I'm trying to I'm trying to make you think. And listen, in the end, I want you to start getting comfortable with the fact that you may not always agree with Pastor Matt. Okay, I want everybody to get real comfy with that. You may not always agree with me, but I'm trying to here to provoke your thinking. And I'm here trying to, trying to help you provoke your thought. And then you can go back to the scripture and you can study to show yourself approved. A right man that rightly devised the well, workman that rightly devised the word of truth, he shall not be ashamed. And so what I'm trying to tell you is, is that if you didn't have a sinful nature, you wouldn't have a flesh problem. Amen. Okay? That's, real, that's as simple as it's going to get right there. All right. So, and, but, the, but the scripture teaches that, that even though we inherited this evil nature from the fall of Adam, that, that whenever we die in Christ, okay, we're not, even though the sinful nature is not eradicated or completely destroyed, when we get saved, according to Romans 6, it teaches us that our uh, relationship with this evil nature is supposed to be dead. It's dead. Okay, right, dead, right? So and the scripture says it. Shall we continue in sin, Romans 6, 1? Okay, or in verse 2, God forbid, how can we that are dead to, and if you look at it in the Greek language, the sin, so it's talking about the sinful nature, God forbid, how can we that are dead to the sinful nature live any longer therein? I used to use a, an analogy about my old girlfriend. I had an old girlfriend in Lafayette, okay? And, and look, the last I heard, she's, she's not dead, and, and I'm not dead, but the thing that we had going on between us is dead, right? Okay, listen, physically, I'm not dead when it comes to the sinful nature, and the sinful nature is not eradicated, but in Christ, and me understanding that my faith is in Him and His finished work, and the Holy Spirit and grace, the grace of the Holy Spirit that flows through that. Now, that thing that me and sin had 
between us is dead. That relationship together is dead. There's not, there's not supposed to be this desire, this, this desire to go towards, or definitely not, I should not be a slave to sin as a believer to where I can say no to temptation, right? And, and I do not have to yield to temptation, but instead I should be yielding to the, the presence of the Lord, yielding to the word of God, yielding to the will of God. Amen. All right. Amen. So it must be understood, though, that this that original sin resulted in this current condition of this unclean earth. Right. And that we and, that, and let me just say this. We share this unclean earth with evil spirits. Right. Yeah. Every day, whenever we're when we're walking around like it ain't like this just because we're just because we're born of Adam. Right. Can we all agree on that? We got scripture to to talk about that, right? That, and so we're sharing this earth with these unclean spirits. And look, they're not real happy with us. They really do hate you and they really do hate me. And they really, really want to mess up your life. Now, the good news is, is that you don't have to fear that. And the good news is that we have authority in Christ over those spirit, yes. unclean spirits of darkness. Amen. But they have a desire and they want to entice us away from God. They want to destroy other people's souls, right? They want to destroy human souls and they want to get us, me and you, so consumed with the cares of the world that we aren't concerned about God's kingdom business. That's what, that's part of what they want to do. They want to either, listen, they either want you and, they either want us to be dead, right? And to destroy our soul or they want to put us on the bench, Okay, that's what that used to happen when we when we played football. You messed up. Or you we couldn't hit the ball. Coach would put you on the bench. The, the evil spirits want to you. They, they want to destroy your soul. But if you truly saved, if you're truly converted, they no longer can destroy your soul. So the next step is they want to sit you on the bench. They want to shut you up. They want to get you out the game. They want to make you ineffective for the kingdom of God. All right, that's their plan. And trust me, they got a plan to do that. All right, so. Going back to the divine nature, okay? So going back to the divine nature because, look, they can want whatever they want, but if you and I begin to understand what we have in Christ, they can't get what they want. Amen? And, and so the word for partaker that we talked about earlier, partaker of the divine nature, y'all heard me talk about that word koinonia a lot, that is translated as communion and fellowship. It's a variant of that. It's koinonos. And, and, and so the idea is that through the new birth in Christ, the Holy Spirit now lives in us. We already know that, right? First Corinthians 6, I believe it's 17, says that when we get saved, we've been talking about that scripture a lot, that your spirit and the Holy Spirit became one. And, and, and that's what it means to be a partaker of the divine nature. The divine nature now is in you and you're partaking of that, your your that flow of grace, that flow of power, that flow of the Holy Spirit is is in you, and it's empowering you, and it's strengthening you. Amen. Holy Spirit now lives in us. His Spirit has been made one with ours, so we have access to an endless flow of grace that supplies us with supernatural power from God. Amen. We can have faith that we can live in victory. We can have faith that we can have victory in our mind. No, you can't. We can have faith that we can have victory in our mind. That we don't have to live in bondage in our mind. We do not have to be a slave to lust. Lust of various sorts. The word lust again in the Greek is just simply a desire. Sometimes it can be good. Sometimes it can be bad. It's not always sexual. Some, sometimes people are driven for more money. Sometimes people are driven for fortune and fame. Sometimes people are driven for more education. Sometimes people are driven just for the American dream. People are driven. They have a lust for something. And it's one thing to be successful if God has blessed you with the ability to be sin. But if that thing becomes your God and, and now you have a covetous desire for more and more and more and it starts to mess up your, your walk with God and it gets between you and God and you're not really living on the earth anymore to, to, to release the glory of God on the earth. Listen, I don't know how well this preaches in other churches. I, listen, what I want to try to help you to do, if, if I have any position at all in the kingdom of God to help you with something, I'm, let me just tell you what I want to help you with. I want to help you with this right here. That when you look at the master, because I want to help myself with that too. Lord, help us, Holy Spirit. I want to I help you with this. That 
whenever you and I stand before the king, when you stand before the king, you hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in small things. Now enter into your rest and be a ruler over many things. That's what I want to try to help you with. Because you see, if I can help you with that, to keep your mind on the kingdom, to keep your mind on your king, to keep your mind on how you are a new creation in Christ, and that if you'll keep your faith there, you're receiving that, you're becoming a partaker of the divine nature of God, Christ is being formed in you, and you're living in victory, then I got good news for you, my friend. If you if you stay like that, all these other things are going to be added unto you. I'm, it don't get no better than this, my friend. friend. Not, not the talking, I'm talking about the truth. It don't get no better than this to understand that you got to keep your eyes singly focused on Jesus, and if that don't preach in America, then guess what? We all need to get an airplane ticket and move somewhere else. Amen. Amen. We got to keep our eyes on Jesus. He's our king. Praise God. So I want to talk to you a little bit about temptation because see, Satan and his unclean spirits want to keep believers in a state of defeat. They don't want us to gain that knowledge of Christ that leads to God's divine power that destroys the power of evil over our lives. It's that simple. I just want to say it's that simple. Faith that Jesus won <laughs> results in his victory over sin in my life. Faith that Jesus won results in his victory over sin in my life. It's that simple. No, really, it is. And, and, and I got to tell you, and, it, and it'll come. It, and, and so that's why Paul said fight the good fight of faith. You know, he used to talk a lot. And some of my teachers that taught me about the fact that you're not fighting sin. The, the word of God never said to fight sin. The word of God said fight the good fight of faith. See, the enemy wants to transition your faith to another object. The enemy wants to frustrate you and make you quit. He wants to give you doubt and unbelief. But if you and I will learn how to keep our faith in Christ and what he's done, we will experience that miracle working power in our life. Okay, so here's this temptation thing. Can we go to James chapter 1 verses 12? We'll just start with 12. We'll read what we may read through 15. We'll see where the Lord leads us with this. James chapter 1, starting in verse 12. He says, blessed is the man that endures temptation. You know, I cannot get this out of my heart, out of my mind, whenever we're talking about that the Lord has put eternal life on my heart recently. He's, been, he's, put, he's put glory. He, he's put the fact that as surely as he lives, his glory will fill the earth on my heart. But he's also put eternal life life on my heart. I cannot get past it. I don't think that I can come up with words to try to make the point of how important I think that this is. I, I, I don't feel like, like without the help of the Holy Spirit, I don't think that we can really wrap our minds around this. We take it for granted. I think we're taking eternal life for granted. I think we're taking the fact that God, I'm not saying you are, I'm saying I have in the past. Let me put it like that. I think that we can get into a trap where we can take eternal life for granted because we've gotten so caught up with this temporary world. And what I'm trying to say is this, is that we have a purpose on this earth. God is calling us to, to function in that purpose. But you and I are, are so privileged. We're so privileged to have had the opportunity, number one, to be born. I'm not going to talk about that vision he gave me yet. Number one, we have been given the opportunity to be born in a world that's filled with people that are like, I didn't ask for this. <coughs> okay, but, they, but, but I want to be, Lord, forgive me. I want to be compassionate because people are full of pain and they're full of heartache. But what they don't know is that they have an opportunity still. Even like if they're unbelievers, okay, uh, and, and, they're, and they're like, they're not happy with their life, they still have an opportunity for eternal life. I'm telling you right now, the word of God says it. Jesus came. He completed the will of the Father. And the will of the Father is that he would have an eternal family. Because God is love and he wants to have a relationship with a, with a creation that's going to give love back to him. And it's so, it's so amazing. I mean, it, it, Paul said it. He said, I hasn't seen, the ear hasn't heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And I just want to tell you that, listen, this temporary world is short. It's a vapor. James said it's nothing but a vapor. It's going to be here today and it's going to be gone tomorrow, right? Be the best, per whatever you do, 
that you can be. Amen. Why you sojourn on this earth, why you are a pilgrim on this earth. If you're a nurse, be the best nurse. Amen. If you're a, if you're a project manager, be the best project manager you can be. Right. But, but at the same time, let's be the best Christians that yes. we can be and let us function right. in, in, in what God has called us to do so that we won't be disappointed. Right. I mean, I don't know how long disappointment lasts when you get to heaven. Because you know what? Why did I even say that? Because when I read the book of Revelation, it says there will be no more tears, right. no right. more sorrow, right. no right. more pain. But I have a hard time believing that in some way, shape or form at the judgment seat of Christ. I mean, it is called the judgment seat of Christ. And it is saying that people's works are going to be burned up. So, I mean, I have a hard time believing that there's not some type of sadness connected to that. No. I don't know. No. no? Okay. I, I, I don't know that I completely agree with that. I don't, I don't, I don't completely agree with that. Okay. And it's okay. Well, again, we don't have to all agree with Pastor Matt and everything that he says, but I will say this is that if you got there and you heard <laughs> that the, what you could have done, yes. at least there's going to be a momentary feeling of sorrow. Okay. And so, and then, but then I'm sure he'll quickly wipe away the tears from our eyes. Amen. Uh, but I just know this, the more I get, to know the Lord, the closer I get to God, I just have a desire to do what he has to accomplish what he's called me to do. Amen. Uh, Solomon, I don't remember the scripture, but he talked about that book. Was it 130, Psalm 136, 17 or something like that? He wrote a book and, and in that book, it's got everything planned for your life. Amen. And I just want to know that, that I worked with the Lord and that his will for my life came to pass. Amen. All right. So blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Now, to endure temptation means that you've gone through the trial and that you came through on the other side. And when it was all said and done and the accounts were, were, were settled, that you came out on the other side victorious because I don't know what you believe as far as maybe some people might believe in once saved, always saved, or whatever the case. But what I'm trying to say is, is, that, is that what I see in the scripture is that there's the possibility that you run into trouble with sin. Sin has its way in your life. And then you fall short of the glory of God. And like they died in the Sinai desert, they never made it into the promised land. And so what I'm trying to say is this, is that blessed is the man that endures the temptation. Blessed is the man that makes it through on the other side and still had his hand in the hand of the man who steals the waters. Okay. And so he says, for when he is tried, you see, because there's got to be a test. God, and that was one of the points that I wanted to make about eternal life. God is not just letting any, like, eternal life is a privilege. Eternal life is an absolute privilege. Now, I'm going to say this, and, 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 and then when, I'm just going to say this, that you're either in or you're out, right? You're either justified or you're not, okay? But I do believe that we have to be careful whenever we know that we're living in blatant sin. Because let me tell you why I think that we have to be, well, I know we have to be careful. Let me tell you why we have to be careful. Because sin will sear the conscience. And, and you will think that you're okay. And the reality of it is, is that you're not okay. And there's that possibility that that's taking place. Now, I will be the first to tell you that I've been very wrong in, a, in, in many years. And I, was, I feel like I was taught wrong. God, the Lord is not looking for a reason to leave. Amen. He's not looking for a reason to leave you. He's looking for a reason to stay. He's committed to you. He's proven that when he died on the cross for us. So he's not looking every time you make a mistake to leave you alone. That's, that's not how the Lord works. Amen. The Lord is long suffering. He's gracious. He's kind. He's merciful. But we have to be able to endure the temptation because look, when he is tried, that means to be put to the test. That literally has to do with being put to the test and it's connected to metals and it's connected to seeing what's really in something. And so the, the temptations that are allowed in the life of a believer are that God has a purpose in it. Now, now let's keep reading right here. It says, but let no man. So, so again, if you endure the trial, you're going to receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Now, 
I want to just say this about that a little bit because see, James says that he's he's gonna there, you can receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. And I keep going back to that scripture where Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So there's something to the fact that the Lord expects, he's expecting his people to walk in covenant with him. And he's expecting his people to allow the presence of the Holy Spirit to teach them the word of God and to trust in Christ that will do that will yeah. give us the do, both the will and the do according to his good pleasure. So so if you love him, then, then you're going to endure the temptation. Amen. So he says, let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God. I think that this is important for God cannot be tempted with evil, evil neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust conceives, it brings forth sin and sin when it is finished, it brings forth death. So let's just talk about a little bit in this passage of scripture. You can just keep it up there for a second. And so, so number one, God's not tempting anybody with evil because God doesn't have evil in him. Right. But 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 what is but what it is saying is this, is that when a man is tempted, he's being drawn away of his own lust. That goes back to the sinful nature that you receive from Adam. That evil nature is in you. And and now the, so where does the temptation come from? See, that's that's the point. That's one point I wanted to try to make when I talk about evil spirits, because I'm trying to provoke your thought. How does this process work? OK, so so if you already have a sinful nature in you, that's supposed to be dormant. Right. right. But then all of a sudden, has anybody ever been walking in victory in your life and you've understood the gospel and you were walking in victory in your life? And then all of a sudden, a, something, a temptation came that you weren't expecting. And, and, and the next thing yeah. you know, you weren't walking in the victory that you yeah. thought you was walking in. OK, that's what I'm trying to say. Where did that come from? Satan. That's that's the point I'm trying. Unclean spirits are trying to provoke you. So so it's important that we understand that that whenever we are being provoked by these unclean spirits, you can feel that because you're being drunk. Look, once you know the word of God, okay, and you know right from wrong, okay. Whenever you begin to feel the draw to go towards that thing which you know is against the word of God, you know that you're being tempted, and sometimes depends upon how strong the pull is. Like I think that that, that and I'm going to show you a scripture here in a second that there's levels. There's levels to this, to the wickedness of these unclean spirits. But guess what? They're defeated in Christ. So, so the flesh, so two things are happening. Number one, because of their fall, they're unclean. Look, the word unclean means a, a, an insatiable appetite for evil. That's what the word unclean means. These demon spirits are not our friends. Okay, there's nothing good. They cannot be redeemed. There's nothing good about them. They want to destroy us. We are not to be playing around with it. And whenever we play around with sin, we're playing around with demon spirits. Okay, so, so what ends up happening is, is that to be drawn away and enticed. I want you to know that both of these words describe one that's being like lured or baited by a trap. Both of those words describe that same concept. A lure on a hook or a bait in a trap. Now, animals operate pretty much only instinctually because they don't have the higher consciousness. They don't have a spirit where they can become God conscious and become alive to the things of God. And so now I'm not saying that there's no smart rats and I'm not saying that there's no smart animals. But for the most part, if there's cheese on a trap, a rat's going to spring the trap. For the, for the most part, if the right bait and the right fisherman knows how to, to jiggle the bait, then the, then the, then the fish is going to get hooked, right? And, but, you know, that doesn't have to be that way with us. Because in Christ, our spirits are made alive to God and the spirit of God is speaking to us and he's leading us towards truth. And so whenever these, these entities are trying to, to bring the, the, the temptation our way and we're feeling it, what we need to understand is, is that that's the spot right there where we need to cut this thing off. 
The problem that we run into is that we play around with it. I'm talking about human beings. I'm not talking about you. The problem that I've had is that we, we don't take it serious enough. And listen, it's never, it's never what it's really going to end up being when it first starts. Does that make sense? Whenever he starts tempting you and you know that you're being tempted, it's never... What, what you first fall into is never the end result. If you don't, if you don't repent and you don't get out of there, then it's going to take you. What would an old preacher used to say? Sin will take you further than you wanted to go, and it'll keep you longer than you wanted to stay. So it never ends up where you started when it didn't seem like it was that big of a deal. It's important that we understand that the the the, the plans of wickedness, man. The the devil has subtlety, right? He's he has wiles, he has tricks, methodia. He has he has schemes. All right. So look at Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45, because I want to just talk a little bit about just about the, something that Jesus said about unclean spirits. He had casted the devil out of this man. And then the Pharisees, if you'll remember, accused him of casting out devils by the prince of devils, bells above. And then he talks quite a bit, a little bit about about these unclean spirits. And so this is Jesus. He says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from where I came out. And when he has come, he finds it empty, swept and garnished. I don't want to spend too much time on that part of it. I just want to make the point this, that demonic spirits are disembodied spirits. It is my contention that demonic spirits come from dead Nephilim. Okay, and I know I've taught that before, but I'm just going to say it again. I believe that demonic spirits at one point in time had a name, Goliath, Og, Anak, okay, and, then, and they were earth dwellers in physical bodies, and when they died, their spirits were released, and now their spirits are on the earth just like we are on the earth, but because they used to be in a body, they lust, they crave a body. Yeah. They're craving a body that they can influence because listen to me, you got lust in you? Okay, like have you ever experienced lust? That's what I'm trying to ask you. Have you ever experienced lust? Yes, you, you, you've experienced lust of some sort. And so what happens is, is that the, the lust in you, if you're falling prey to sin, it wants to act out on the desires that are in you, right? I mean, is that not the problem? He says, when every man is tempted, let him not say he's tempted by God, for God does not tempt any man with evil, okay? And so, and he says, but yet instead, each man, when he is tempted, is drawn away according to his own lust. So the scripture tells us that in our birth of Adam, we have sin and we have uh, uh, there's the possibility that we can be drawn away according to our own lusts, right? Because we received that in Adam. But what I'm trying to tell you is this, though, is that these that these things, even though we don't know exactly what they were up to, we don't know exactly what they were up to, but we can kind of imagine because I believe that these that this is was the problem before the flood. This is why God destroyed the earth with a flood because He says that the thoughts of man was continuously wicked. Now, I'm not going to try to prove anything by this, but I'm going to ask you, not that I'm asking you to think bad thoughts, but what I'm going to ask you to do is to remember whenever you were your worst off in your life. I can remember some times when I was my worst off and just imagine just for a split second what the thoughts were in your mind. Like how the, the thoughts that were taking place in your mind, right? And the things that you were being tempted to do and the things that you were being drawn to do and the things that you actually ended up doing. Now, okay, now let's erase that. Lord, take those thoughts out of our mind. All right, so now we're back over here. So what I'm trying to say though is this, is that those demon spirits used to do some crazy stuff too. And they're looking for a body that they can influence because they want to live their lust out through human bodies. And so what I need, and all I'm really trying to talk to you about is to understand what I believe is going on whenever temptation takes place. It's like they know that you got a target area in you and, and, and they want to get you to act out. And the problem is, is that whenever we begin to act out is that now we're yielding to sin instead of yielding to the Holy Spirit, instead of yielding to the will of God. And whenever we yield to sin, that's whenever the possibility of opening up the door comes in. Now I want to I just say this. 
for, for quite some time. But, so, so, but we don't have to live in that, right? They're trying to stimulate our flesh in order to get us to yield. That can open up the door to sin. Now, I'm not trying to say this, that just because you open up a door to sin, that you automatically have to live in bondage to that sin for some period of time. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just making a point. <laughs> when we yield to sin, we open up the door to sin. That's what I'm trying to say. And we're giving an opportunity for the enemy to bring us down a road where we're being influenced by this sin. And, and there's a possibility that we could be driven deeper into that those acts of sin. Okay. And so so I wanted you I wanted you to just say say that. But look, it, we can cut it off right away. Because you know there, there was a time. We, we, we kind of like have over the last year and a half questioned, okay, are they on you? Talking about demon spirits, right? Are they on you? Are they in you, right? And we've all had different opinions, right? What can they do to Christians? What can they not do to Christians? Okay, I don't even want to talk about that. Right That's not my point. My, my, but my point is this, is that if we give in, we are allowing them the opportunity to influence us more. Has anybody, like, am I the only one that's ever fallen short of the glory of God and saw where I started off right here and it wasn't that bad and within a couple of weeks it was so much worse and in two months it was so much worse and even after understanding things connected to the truth of the gospel. Okay, so what I'm trying to say though is this, is that we don't have to fall into that trap because look, the word of God says in Galatians 5 and 24, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. We don't have to get to the point where the, the demons are on you, in you, messing with your head, whatever you think. No, when you feel the temptation, you got we got to understand I'm dead to that. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. The old has passed away. All things have become new. But you know what part of the problem is too? Let me just say this. Part of the problem is, is that we're not convinced we don't want it sometimes. Now, now I don't think that that's a right relationship with the Lord. But, but if you will be told the truth of the gospel and you will be told how much the Lord loves you and that, and that the Lord has died to, to give you freedom and liberty that, and you will become sick of sin and you will want to be free. And, and whenever you begin to put your hope and trust in the Lord and what he's done, amen, you have victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil, amen? So in this manner, I would say that that evil spirit never gets his chance to attach himself or to live his pleasures. I know that, that people, people may have a problem with that, but, but I believe that with all of my heart that that's actually what's going on, uh, that that we are in an absolute battle with these entities and that they, their desire is to destroy us. But the good news is this, is that we have victory in Christ. Amen. So we singers, musicians, y'all can come up. So the flesh is crucified by faith and the enticement is not yielded to in this situation, right? The evil, evil spirit never gets a chance to attach or enter whatever you, however you look at that, and because the flesh is crucified. So we're kind of like before, you know, Brother Swagger used to say the clinging fall, vines of the fall, right? And you ever, you ever imagine like vines being wrapped around you and like, and they were trying to pull you back. I mean, at that point in time, you kind of like, you would need like a machete or something right in the physical, I'm trying to talk about. So, so these things are on you. You need a machete to cut it. But look, it's, but, if, but if we'll learn how to walk in such a way where whenever that temptation is trying to come, I, no, Satan, I, that, that, that's, you're trying to draw my flesh, but I'm not walking in the flesh. I'm walking in the spirit. I'm a new creation in Christ, and I'm a partaker of the divine nature. I am a partaker of the divine nature and the Holy Spirit in me is giving me victory over this temptation and I do not have to yield to this. Praise God. That's how I want to that's how I want to handle it. Right. And so anyway, so when we belong to him, we have the knowledge that we share natures with him, which means that the same cross that crucified him crucifies our flesh and the same spirit that raised him from the dead gives us life. We walk in victory and sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law, but you are under grace. So